Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. We will now proceed to panel two titled The Partition of Manly and Palestine, November 1947. The distinguished panelists for this session are Professor Penny Sinan Apple, Assistant Professor of History, Wake Forest University, United States. Professor Laura Robson, Assistant Professor of Modern Middle Eastern History, Portland State University, United States. Chairing the session is Dr. Victor Katan, Senior Research Fellow, MEI NUS. I will now hand the floor to Dr. Katan. Thank you very much. Uh, good morning. Uh, welcome to our second panel on the partition of the Mandate Palestine. We have two very exciting papers being presented this morning. Um, I'll introduce each speaker in turn, and then after the second paper, I'll comment on them and then open for, for questions. So our first speaker is uh, Dr. Penny Sinanbalu, who is an assistant professor of history at uh, Wake Forest University. She received her PhD from Harvard University and her BA in history and Middle Eastern and Asian languages and cultures from Columbia University. She's published widely on partition, but uh, uh, she's recently finished a monograph which is titled Partitioning Palestine British policy making at the end of the empire, which I understand is now under contract with the University of Chicago Press. So first, uh, a great thanks to the organizers for the invitation and also to the staff for, I can only imagine, handling all of these international visitors and the logistics, so we really appreciate everything that you've done. This would be a very difficult presentation without maps, so. Okay. When the United Nations General Assembly voted on November 29th, 1947 to recommend the adoption of a, of a partition plan for British Mandate Palestine, it was bringing onto the international stage a concept that had been developing in British imperial circles for about two decades. After percolating since the late 1920s through official and unofficial channels in the form of conversations, memoranda, and maps, partition emerged into public view in the form of a proposal put forward by the Royal Commission, which I'll get to, I'll give you that, um, in the summer of 1937. Lord William Peel, the Commission's ailing, industrious chairman, a former Secretary of State for India, so maybe a point of convention here, uh, and the grandson of former Prime Minister Sir Robert Peel, led a group of similarly distinguished politicians and academics in their exhaustive authoritative report published that July, so July of 1937, the Peel commissioners formally recommended the partition of Palestine into Arab and Jewish states with select areas to be maintained under British control. But partition, as many of you know, did not fare much better than Lord Peel, who died in September 1937 as the debate raged over the partition plan. Against the backdrop of a renewed and intensified Arab uprising in Palestine and a deteriorating political situation in Europe, partition suffered death by a thousand cuts. Though the British government initially supported the Peel Commission's 1937 partition proposal, strategic concerns and intense opposition from key quarters uh, quite quickly uh, soured the government on partition. The magisterial Peel Report, authored in large part by the Oxford professor, professor Reginald Copeland, was followed in 1938 by the work of a technical commission, we want to think about boundary drawing, um, the Woodhead Commission, which had tellingly been nicknamed by residents of Palestine the Repeal Commission. Its members produced a damning and ironically split report on the immense difficulties of drawing a partition line. Finally, on the eve of war, Britain issued the 1939 White Paper declaring partition impracticable um, and instead proposing new policies including sharp numerical and temporal limits on Jewish immigration designed to establish a single independent state of Palestine within the coming decade. In the midst of war, however, as Britain began long-term planning for a Palestine policy, discussion immediately reverted to the prospects of partition, which gained support from within the British War Cabinet. Attempts at resolving the Palestine issue through efforts such as the Anglo-American Commission of 1946 and a series of conferences with Arab and Jewish leaders all failed. 
And so, by early 1947, Britain began to look for an exit. Uh, this was also an, an incredibly expensive conflict um, that they were managing. What British officials had long referred to as the Palestine problem was officially internationalized with the decision the British cabinet took on February 14, 1947 to refer the question of future, of future policy for Palestine to the United Nations. The passage of Resolution 181, some nine months later, signaled the parallel internationalization of partition itself. The aim of the larger essay from which this is drawn um, is to track the transition from British imperial to international partition planning, analyzing the relationship between the Peel Commission's partition proposal of 1937, the Woodhead Commission's multiple unworkable partition plans, on the one hand, these British partition plans, and on the other hand, the work of the UN Special Committee on Palestine and the resulting partition plan voted on by the UN General Assembly a decade later. So sort of looking to connect the dots between 1937 and 1947. Um, the longer essay from which this presentation is drawn uh, seeks to track both the numerous continuities but also the substantial differences between the two moments and thus to recover the British imperial roots of the UN's partition plan. Tracing cartographic, demographic, financial, and political ideas and practices as they developed from an interwar British context to a post-war international one, the paper demonstrates the many ways in which key personnel and concepts from the era of the Peel Commission helped to shape the debates for and debates over partition in the post-war period. The essay establishes the contours and provisions of the 1937 and 1947 plans, which I'll do for you as briefly as I can, um, in order to understand what are underlying structures and assumptions they had in common, and what shifted as partition moved from an imperial to an international tool. Um, I, I'll try to delineate for you both the parallels and divergences between the 1937 and 1947 plans in an effort to understand what difference the British antecedents made to the process and outcomes of Unstock's work. Um, and as with all history, we cannot run a double-blind experiment. Right? We don't know how the you know, Unstock plan would have looked had the British not uh, engaged in partition planning in the 30s, but I'll try to, um, try to sort of lay out how those British plans mattered. So, um, to keep the presentation within the time limit um, and to keep the focus on the UN partition plan of 1947 within this sort of broader context, um, I want to take just a few minutes here to point out the key features of the Peel Partition Plan um, and the contours of the Woodhead maps. So, very quickly, as you're generally speaking, um, the Peel Plan envisioned an Arab state, roughly in the east and the south, um, to be joined with Transjordan. Um, this is sort of a, an important, so sometimes forgotten uh, piece here, that this, this was meant to be both a partition and then a merger. Um, with Transjordan, which <coughs> those of you who know the history, Transjordan had sort of been partitioned off from a larger Palestine um, at the beginning of the British Mandate. Um, a Jewish state in the north and the west, and then a new permanent British mandatory area covering uh, the holy cities of Jerusalem, Nazareth, and Bethlehem, um, the area of Lake Tiberias, which is the biblical Sea of Galilee, um, a sort of odd corridor to Jaffa, um, a small enclave on the northwest coast of the Gulf of Aqaba. Um, you can already see all the exceptions. Um, and for an indeterminate time, the so-called mixed towns um, of Haifa, Akko, Spad, and Tiberias. Um, perhaps not surprisingly, given its authors, the Peel Plan explicitly aimed at retaining British control over both symbolic and geostrategic assets. Um, these included you know, Christian holy sites, um, airfields, the oil pipeline from Iraq, military installations, um, and of course, uh, access to a deep water port in the Mediterranean. With regards to economies, the Peel Partition Plan, and this you can't see on the map, um, included treaty-based and financial workarounds for the potential disruption, I mean, the almost certain disruption, uh, to the Palestinian economy that partition would represent. Uh, while the treaties that the commissioners had sketched out would, in, would include um, basically minorities uh, guarantees, the final section um, of the plan dealing with partition was the one to tackle the dreaded, as they called it, exchange of land and population, um, which the commissioners thought should be strongly encouraged and quite possibly, uh, and it looked quite likely, made compulsory 
Um, this was a particularly pressing issue as around 225,000 Arabs would be left in the bounds of the new Jewish state. Um, and this is, again, something that doesn't often get talked about, I think, as much as it should um, when we talk about the Peel Plan. The Peel Plan really depended, its coherence depended on forced population transfer. Um, uh, that, that was quite clear. Um, and we can talk about the models for that, um, and you know, they do make reference to the Greek and Turkish population exchanges. I think we'll get into that now for reasons of time, but that's certainly uh, present in their minds. As it happens, the realities of demography, agriculture, finance, and politics in Palestine meant that any detailed study of partition was bound to come to the conclusion that the so-called clean cut uh, would be anything but clean. Anchored by reams of technical data, the report of the Technical Commission uh, the Woodhead Commission that sent in after the appeal comes back with this kind of charming but vague map. Um, and uh, a, a second commission is then sent in to actually kind of do the dirty work of figuring out how this is uh, going to work. Um, they're strongly encouraged before they leave to come back and say that it's not going to work. Um, but so the Woodhead Commission outlined three uh, partition plans. A so-called majority plan, which is plan C over here. I don't know how well you can see the salient point is. You will see endless sort of corridors and exceptions. Um, uh, so the, the majority plan, supported by two of the four commissioners, um, so not really a majority. Um, plan B in the middle, advocated by one member, and plan A, rejected unanimously by the commission, but still presented um, in the report. Um, the commission basically used the Peel plan as a baseline, um, modifying the lines proposed by that commission, and eventually in the so-called majority plan, uh, plan C, eventually severely shrinking the proposed Jewish state and radically enlarging, not the Arab state, but the mandated areas, um, in its effort to devise a workable solution. None of the three proposals were at all satisfactory, um, as I said, even the supposed majority plan only had two people supporting it. Um, and so on November 9, 1938, the government published a white paper, along with the Woodhead Commission report, publicly declaring what it had privately decided months earlier, in fact, before the Woodhead Commission had ever gone to Palestine. Um, namely, the, and I'm quoting here, the political, administrative, and financial difficulties involved in the proposal to create independent Arab and Jewish states inside Palestine are so great that the solution of the problem is impractical. So we're sort of back where we started. Uh, the Peel Report's recommendations were openly dismissed, um, and the public abandonment of partition was made possible by the final convergence of British political needs and the conclusions born of a detailed analysis of the practical aspects of partition in the Woodhead Report. Given the impending war, however, it seems likely that partition would have been jettisoned one way or another, or at least put on hold, right? This was not the moment to start uh, uh, trying to partition, right? After all, the commissioners had arrived, the Woodhead commissioners had arrived in Palestine just after the Anschluss um, of March 1938, uh, and published their report shortly after the Munich settlement over Czechoslovakia. So this wasn't exactly the moment to sort of pull the way out uh, from under uh, the, the Middle East. Despite its apparent demise um, in 1939 with the white paper, um, partition survived the war and, as we know, reemerged most famously in the United Nations Plan of 1947. Partitionist thinking was visible in British approaches to policy in areas ranging from land to municipal governance in the period following the white paper, as well as in a range of British wartime and post-war proposals made before the UN ever took up the question of Palestine. So partition really does survive um, and just sort of keeps reemerging throughout the war. On February 18th, 1947, with the latest roundtable conference between British officials and Arab and Jewish representatives having failed, Foreign Secretary Ernest Bevan addressed the House of Commons. His Majesty's government, he said, have of themselves no power, this is <coughs> in our discussions, under the terms of the mandate, to award the country either to the Arabs or to the Jews, or even to partition it between them. It is in these circumstances that we have decided that we are unable to accept the scheme put forward either by the Arabs or by the Jews, or to impose ourselves a solution of our own. We have therefore reached the conclusion that the only course now open to us is to submit the problem to the judgment of the United Nations. 
and this is a sort of masterful piece of imperial rhetoric, right? We have no power. Um, uh, but as, as Bevan indicated in his speech, part of turning over the question of the mandate also involved turning over reams of written and statistical material to the United Nations. And so the UN began its study of the problem deeply reliant on British documents, and therefore profoundly shaped by prior British interest in partition. Um, and I think this is fundamental, right? Partition planning in, in, under the UN doesn't come out of nowhere. It's built on the sort of foundation um, of British approaches and British studies. Uh, Trinity Lee, the UN Secretary General, directed Arkady Sobolev, the Russian Assistant Secretary General for Security Council Affairs, to form a team composed of five members to study the question. And material on the Palestine question was collected and kept in a special library at the UN. Five volumes of statistics and a whole sort of collection of old British proposals and plans were published. And these were used not only by that team of five, but also by the eventual UN Special Committee on Palestine and, so on, um, and by the Partition uh, Commission entrusted with actually implementing partition after the November 1947 vote. Right? There's sort of the parallel, I guess, to the Woodhead. Uh, Ralph Bunch, the American political scientist and diplomat, played a role in all three of these groups. An initial member of the small team of five, um, he, you know, appointed to collect, collate, and produce material on Palestine, Bunch then accompanied UNSCOP to Palestine as a special assistant and ran the Secretariat of the Partition Commission. We know that in addition to material officially handed over by the British, um, Bunch and others received private memoranda, right? There were all these sort of back room connections. Um, for instance, an analysis of past partition plans written by Sir Douglas Harris, um, whose 1936 cantonization plans and later partition plans and memoranda really formed the basis of the Peel partition plans. Um, Harris had very close contacts with Reginald Copeland, who wrote a lot of the uh, Peel report, so there's, you know, there are also sort of personnel threads um, tying the 37 and 47 planning together. Uh, Harris had remained active during World War II in developing territorial solutions to the Palestine problem on a range of scales, and had been a critical link between the British partition planning of the 1930s and that of the 1940s. The hallmarks of British partitioning, partition planning are evident in the UNSCOP plan and in the slightly modified version of this plan that was eventually voted on by the UN General Assembly. Um, the, the legacy of the Peel partition plan was apparent in the proposals of UNSCOP made at the end of August 1947, a mere two weeks after the disastrous partition of India. Um, though, as we'll see in a second, the UNSCOP plan was in fact closer in its details to the Woodhead B plan, right? Um, so not the majority plan, not the plan that everybody had rejected, but the plan that one member had supported um, in Woodhead. Um, at a structural and procedural level, the UNSCOP report, like the Peel report, was the result of an in-depth and in-country investigation. The 11-member special committee spent two weeks in, in Palestine, several days in Lebanon, Syria, and Transjordan, and in a sign of the impact of the European Jewish crisis on the question of Palestine, a week in displaced persons camps in Germany and Austria. As with the Peel Commission, UNSCOP heard evidence in public and private sessions, um, as well as in informal meetings. And there are really striking parallels, I think, in, in the ways in which Jewish and Arab leaders approached or didn't approach um, these two bodies. Uh, Palestinian Arab leaders had boycotted the Peel Commission until really the last minute, um, and so their testimony was quite rushed. It came at the end of, of, of a long period of time in which the commissioners had sort of absorbed uh, particularly sort of Zionist uh, ideas. Um, and with UNSCOP, they followed a complete boycott. I mean, they never, they never presented uh, public evidence. Um, meanwhile, as they had done with the Peel Commission, Zionist leaders presented a detailed and finely wrought case in public um, and worked incredibly successfully and with great energy on diplomatic and back channels in order to increase the chance that UNSCOP would, as Peel had, come up with a favorable proposal. So after considering unitary, um, binational, cantonal possibilities, kind of looking at the full range, 
unstopped, unstopped proposed two plans, one endorsed by the minority and the other by the majority of its members. The minority proposal, supported by the committee members from India, Iran, and Yugoslavia, outlined the creation of a new independent federal state of Palestine with a bicameral federal legislature and federal courts, in addition to the legislatures and courts of the individual Arab and Jewish states. Um, one federal chamber would be elected proportionally to the Arab and Jewish populations in the entire country, while the other would contain equal numbers of Arab and Jewish representatives. So this is one of these ways of trying to sort of soften um, the, the question of representation and sovereignty. Uh, the federal government would have control over matters such as defense, foreign policy, federal taxation, transport, um, and most significantly, of course, for this case, immigration, while the individual state governments would have authority over issues such as education, local taxation, land permits, settlement, policing, public health, agriculture, the sort of things you would expect. Um, in some ways, this minority plan had its roots in cantonal plans developed by British officials in the early to mid-1930s. Um, there are striking parallels, and we know that they had access to those plans. By contrast, the majority plan, supported by Canada, Czechoslovakia, Guatemala, Holland, Peru, Sweden, and Uruguay, um, and Australia was a member of uh, this commission, they abstained, um, strongly echoed the central recommendation of the Peel Report in as much as it advocated partition into two states. It also more fully developed the Peel Plan's economic ideas by proposing a full economic union and mirroring in some ways the mandated areas of the Peel Plan. Um, you know, they proposed creating Jerusalem as a corpus separatum under a special international regime. The differences between the Peel Plan and the UNSCOP Plan were, however, substantial. Um, this is not terribly surprising when we consider that the Peel Commissioners included a number of key figures with extensive imperial experience and their unstated aim, but nevertheless their aim, was to resolve the conflict in Palestine while simultaneously preserving Britain's moral and material interests in the region. The UNSCOP members, on the other hand, were drawn from a range of countries with different approaches to <coughs> interests in the Palestine question, um, and a number of which you know, explicitly gave their representatives the freedom to develop plans and vote their consciences, vote as their consciences dictated rather than as their nations their sort of national interests um, will play. Um, so, right, there's, there's a very different sort of set of uh, interests and parameters at play. Um, one of the most significant divergences between the Peel and UNSCOP majority plans was therefore that the UNSCOP plan did not envision Britain playing a continued role in Palestine as the mandatory or trustee over any part of the territory. Indeed, the first unanimously agreed upon recommendation in the UNSCOP report was that the mandate of Palestine should be terminated, right? And that sort of had to be said. Um, and a further unanimous recommendation was that the United Nations would supervise the body in charge of the transition period. So there was, Britain was basically, you know, Britain had relinquished uh, this control, but that, that was emphasized um, in the UNSCOP report. All of the predecessors to the Peel Plan, all of the Woodhead Plans, and all of Britain's wartime plans had assumed a formal continued British presence and control over resources as varied as the holy sites of Jerusalem, the oil pipeline that ran to Haifa from the oil fields of Iraq, and the, air, and the airfields that were crucial for uh, British communications. Not surprisingly, UNSCOP evinced no interest in preserving imperial access to these areas. On a related point, the UNSCOP partition plan did not propose amalgamating the new Arab state and Transjordan, right? And this is important. Um, this was a characteristic it shared along with the removal of the Galilee from the Jewish state with the Woodhead B plan, right? So it, it, it actually bears uh, sort of the most resemblance to the middle Woodhead map. Um, and it was one that really differentiated it from the original Peel plan. Again, this change is one we can attribute to the fact that combining the Arab state and Transjordan was an objective of many British policymakers who saw such a unification as a way to retain access to critical geostrategic positions via Britain's ally, the Emir Abdullah of Transjordan, who from 1946 is King Abdullah. Unifying the Arab state and Transjordan would also, from the British perspective, have the advantage of nullifying the political power of the Mufti of Jerusalem, Ajibin al Husseini, who had been instrumental in the Arab uprising of 1936 to 1939 and during World War II had cast his law with the Nazis. 
We know from the work of historians uh, such as Avi Schleim that while the UN was busy planning a partition that did not involve a greater transjordan, right, this sort of partition and combination, that is precisely what Zionist and Hashemite operatives were seeking with the blessing of the British. Um, so I guess, you know, there's also a point here which is partition planning happens at one level and then there's other sorts of planning that happens behind it. Finally, I think we have to note that whereas the Peel commissioners saw population and land transfer as great necessities that they were, such great necessities that they were willing to make them compulsory, um, even as they emphasized the need for minority protection, the UNSCOP partition plan, on the contrary, privileged choice in matters of citizenship and gave greater detail about the rights to be preserved for all residents of Palestine. The UNSCOP report unanimously recommended that the laws of the new state or states give specific guarantees concerning human rights, fundamental freedoms, um, you know, they sort of enumerate in quite great detail um, freedom of worship, conscience, press, assemblage, uh, the full protection of rights and interests of minorities, linguistically, religiously, ethnically, all sorts of, um, you know, there's quite a detailed uh, enumeration of these rights. With regard to citizenship, the UNSCOP partition plan envisioned that all residents of Palestine would be granted the citizenship of the state in which they found themselves resident in upon independence, or if they were resident in, in the corpus separatum of Jerusalem, would declare which state's citizenship they desired to obtain. Those who wished could opt within, and I'm quoting here, opt within one year for the, for the citizenship of the other state, i.e. the one they weren't in, or declare they retain this, the citizenship of any state for which they are citizens. So this is interesting, right? It, it's not just that they don't envision forced population transfer, it's they envision potentially you know, what's sort of implicit in here is that possibly there will be Jews in the Arab state who will elect to remain citizens of that state and vice versa, um, which is, I think, very interesting. Um, far from being forcibly relocated, that is, the new citizens would have a good deal of latitude to decide their own future states and their own citizenship. Finally, UNSCOP saw fit to specify that, quote, no expropriation of land owned by an Arab in the Jewish state or by a Jew in the Arab state shall be allowed, um, except for public purposes. Um, there, you know, there were provisions about land remaining unused and uncultivated for a certain period of time, and they stipulated that the Supreme Court of the state in question would have to approve the expropriation. Um, while this provision might be open to interpretation and certainly to manipulation, the point remains that the UNSCOP partition plan explicitly ruled out forced land transfers, along with forced population transfers. Remembering that its members had just witnessed the mass, the mass violence and bloodshed that accompanied large-scale population movement in the aftermath of the partition of India goes some way, perhaps, uh, towards explaining UNSCOP's aversion to the population transfer envisioned by the Peel Commission, though it raises a more perplexing question about their support for partition as an overall concept. So on balance then, what did the 1937 Peel Partition Plan mean for the UNSCOP planners? And what can we usefully learn about the UN's 1947 Partition Plan by looking back at it? For one thing, it, I think it's clear that the, U, that the UN plan was not a facsimile of the Peel Plan. As I've just noted, crucial elements, not to mention borders, were substantially changed because the concerns of those drawing up the plans were markedly different. Internationalizing the Palestine problem led to a partition plan that had little to do with British interests, but I think it actually encoded a whole other set of imperial interests. They're just not British ones, right? They're sort of Soviet ones, they're American ones, but, but they're not British ones. On the other hand, however, it mattered both pragmatically and intellectually for the UN planners that partition had been considered in such detail by prior British planners. On a practical level, UNSCOP had models to tweak or abandon statistics on which to base their work, maps and plans, and even input from those who had been instrumental in the work of proposing partition 10 years earlier. In the realm of ideas, it mattered for UNSCOP that its report was not the first time partition was being proposed. In contrast to the Peel Report, which really oddly, it's 400 pages, um, but it tacks on the partition proposal almost as an afterthought. It's an incredibly short little section. Um, so, so the Peel Report tacked on the partition proposal and could only vaguely sketch out its contours, 
the UNSCOP report was able to build on the work of the Wood, Woodhead and Peel commissions. Those UNSCOP members in favor of partition were likewise able to slowly but surely build consensus around a plan whose basic concepts were familiar to all on the committee. Most crucially, I think, the experience of 1937 had made it clear what the Zionist and Arab responses would be to the UN's partition plan. And so staunch Arab opposition came as absolutely no surprise. It didn't derail uh, the sort of partition proposal in the way that it had um, in 1938. Hand handling the debate over partition in 1937, and sort of learning the politics of partition in 1937, meant that Zionist leaders were in a much stronger position in 1947 to lobby UNSCOP members, push successfully for a favorable order, and expertly, and a really sort of a brilliant rhetorical move, frame the Zionist acceptance of partition as a compromise rather than a victory. Finally, it seems hard to ignore the fact that in both 1937 and 1947, partition was in fact, as Victor said, a non-event. Um, we talk and write of the partition of Palestine, but unlike the partition of India, or if Ireland say this partition never happened. In both decades, the messy reality of implementation, anti-partition politics, and of course war, ensured that partition plans remained just that. Thank you. 
But this Palestinian bowl in international governance would become even more apparent in 1947, when the newly constituted UN seized on the idea, with British assistance, of taking over the defunct League's role as political puppet master over Palestine. So the task of deciding what would happen to Palestine following the British withdrawal offered the UN, which was after all a brand new institution, uncertain as of yet about how to define itself or understand its own purpose, the opportunity to cast itself in a central role in the making and maintaining of a regional post-war order across the Middle East, and to publicly declare its capacities for state-making at a global level. So I'm arguing here that the UN's decision for partition in 1947 represented a significant step towards a more interventionist state-building strategy for the quote-unquote third world, whose ramifications went well beyond Palestine itself. I won't spend a lot of time on the backdrop here, since I imagine most of you are fairly familiar with the developments in Palestine leading up to 1947. But I do want to point out specifically some of the ways in which the, you know, 28-year period of the mandate um, showcased the creation and the invention of the identifiable political communities of Arab and Jew in Palestine um, in ways that were important for the kind of future imagining of the idea of partition. Um, as most of you likely know, Palestine began to see Zionist immigration from Europe in the late 19th century, around the same time that the British government started to explore the possibility of incorporating Palestine into the empire, mostly on the grounds of its strategic location vis-a-vis -vis Egypt and India. The First World War offered the relevant imperial opportunity, and the Zionist movement emerged as a potential ally. In November of 1917, a month before the British army entered the gates of Jerusalem, British Foreign Secretary Arthur Balfour penned a letter with the approval of the British War Cabinet to the London-based Zionist leader Walter Rothschild committing the British government to the cause of large-scale Jewish immigration into Palestine with a view to creating a, quote, Jewish national home. For our purposes, it's important to note that in July of 1922, the Balfour Declaration's commitment to mass European Jewish settlement in Palestine was ratified by the League of Nations document that incorporated the wording of the Declaration into the legal instrument that gave Britain mandatory authority over Palestine. So there are a couple of things to note about this moment. Um, the text of the Palestine Mandate, which is one of these documents that has been kind of endlessly parsed, um, but not always thoroughly understood, I think, um, provided a framework of ethno-national sovereignty for the settler population, but not indigenous citizens, unless they happen to be Jewish, and it explicitly tied political rights to communal affiliation. So this relates to some of the things that we heard about in the last panel. We are seeing here the beginnings of a remaking of social and economic um, identifiers, cultural identifiers, as specifically political in nature. That is, from now on, from the beginning of the mandate, the labels of Arab and Jew carried not only cultural and social connotations, but also carried differentiated political rights, differentiated access to the mandatory state. Um, so we can see this, you know, there's a, the, in, in the kind of adaptation of the language of the Balfour Declaration um, into the League's um, document, which declared, quote, the mandatory shall be responsible for placing the country under such political, administrative, and economic conditions as will secure the establishment of the Jewish national home and the development of self-governing institutions, that is for Jews, not Arabs, and also for safeguarding the civil and religious rights of all the inhabitants of Palestine, irrespective of race and religion. So in this context, state and empire building were not mutually exclusive projects. And Zionists set to work immediately with British encouragement to develop new proto-state institutions of self-government that were made possible by the new British military occupation of Palestine and supported by the League. In the view of the Palestinian political elite, of course, the Balfour Declaration was fundamentally illegitimate from the beginning, and for the next three decades, Palestinian activists would find themselves fighting a rearguard action against these founding documents of the mandate, which legally enshrined the principle that Jewish identity conferred particular political rights not shared by either Muslim or Christian Arabs. Mm. 
As the mandatory state was established, um, its British architects further formalized and institutionalized this legal and political distinction between the Jewish settler community, which became known as the Yishuv, and the indigenous Arab community. Under mandate rule, the Yishuv enjoyed a number of collective rights and privileges not extended to Arabs, such as a recognized internal legislative assembly, explicitly nationalist schools and language policies, a flag, and of course, a military wing. This led to a situation by the time we get to the early 1930s of a very divided Palestine that is sometimes referred to as the dual society, in which Arabs and Jews occupied separate political, economic, social, and cultural spheres that had largely been determined by the institutional and, institutional and legal, particularly legal structures of the British mandatory government. As Penny has already pointed out, in the spring of 1936, this began to come to a head um, as an Arab general strike brought the country to a standstill and quickly turned into huge anti-Zionist and anti-British demonstrations, leaving the colonial government significantly to expand its military presence. Mm. To crush the demonstrators, the British began to deploy some of the, quote, counterinsurgency methods they had developed, in particularly in pre-partition Ireland. This included recruiting former members of the notoriously brutal Black and Tans to join the Palestine police force. So yet another example of some of the personnel connections among these cases of partition in the late British Empire. Facing this widespread and organized Arab resistance, as we've seen, the British government appointed a royal commission um, to investigate the causes of what they called the unrest and make a recommendation about future British policy. We've already seen then how in 1937 the commission published its findings with a nearly 400 page report detailing the increasingly violent and hostile conditions on the ground and proposing for the first time a quote unquote solution, partitioning Palestine into separate Arab and Jewish states. Mm. This particular scheme combined the principles of partition and transfer in that it was to be made possible not only by the Zionist acquisition of huge amounts of Arab territory, but also by the forcible expulsion of somewhere between 250 and 300,000 Arabs, and simultaneously somewhere around 1,200 Jews, to create a Jewish majority in the proposed Jewish state. And this transfer was justified, particularly at the level of the League, um, with reference to the Greek-Turkish exchange of 1923, um, whose architects lauded it as a successful example of nation state building. So broadly speaking, um, although the delegates of that year's Zionist Congress were unwilling to accept these territorial specifics, believing that the land provided was insufficient for the Jewish state, they did accept the principle of partition and empowered the Zionist leadership to continue negotiations with the intention of eventually achieving a more favorable deal. But of course, the partition and transfer proposal aroused immediate and implacable opposition among Palestinian Arabs who viewed it as little more than outright theft. And given the maps that we've looked at, it's worth remembering. Um, it's worth remembering that in 1947, on the eve of the war, Jewish um, owners owned approximately 6% of the land in Palestine, so we can see the kind of appropriation of territory that would have been required to, to enforce even um, the Peel Commission plan. So as Palestinian anger and the revolt both intensified after the publication of these plans, um, the British administration began to reconsider its position and they sent in the second commission of inquiry, the Woodhead Commission, which eventually abandoned the idea. And it was only a decade later, in a very different international and local context, that this almost forgotten scheme was reintroduced. So now we come to the main point. In February of 1947, an increasingly embattled and financially strapped British government pressed not only by ongoing Arab opposition to the continuation of the mandate, but also by Zionist militias engaging in terrorist activity against British and Arab civilian targets, 
announced its intention to withdraw from Palestine and turn over the question of its future to the newly formed UN. In May, the United Nations announced the formation of a new commission, the United Nations Special Commission on Palestine, briefly known as UNSCOP, to investigate the situation and make recommendations on the future of the state. It had 11 members, none of whom represented voices on the Security Council. Um, they came from Australia, Canada, Czechoslovakia, Guatemala, India, Iran, the Netherlands, Peru, Sweden, Uruguay, and Yugoslavia. And none of them had significant previous knowledge of Palestine. The Jewish agency had pressed hard not to include British or Arab representatives on the commission. They successfully lobbied for its members to visit displaced persons camps in Germany and Austria, as Penny mentioned and one Zionist representation on the political subcommittee. Mm -hmm. By contrast, the Arab Higher Committee, representing what was left of the Palestinian Arab political establishment, which had been largely demolished during the revolt, saw the resolution as a violation of their right to self-determination and boycotted the proceedings entirely on the grounds that the transition of authority to the UN was illegal and that the question should go to an international court. Mm -hmm. So Zionist arguments to UNSCOP drew on many of the kind of tropes of transfer and partition that had become well established across the Middle East in the previous three decades. A memo from the revisionist group, the right-wing revisionist group Leahy, condensed many of these arguments. They argued that Jewish settlement and nationhood would lead to mass agricultural and industrial development. They argued for the transfer of Arab populations out of the territory drawing on claims of a long history of effective and successful nation-building exchanges, not only the Greek-Turkish exchange, but also the post-war expulsion of ethnic Germans from Poland and Czechoslovakia, which they described in astoundingly anodyne fashion as, quote, population exchanges between friendly countries. They declared that a pluralistic state was impossible because the majority <coughs> eventually, quote, demand a majority a majority in the government and the majority of the population. And it's worth noting that this was not just a right-wing perspective. In his remarks to UNSCOP at that same, at that same moment, um, Ben-Gurion himself echoed many of these well-established points. He declared that the creation of a Jewish state could, quote, realize the maximum development of all the potentialities of Palestine to cultivate as many mil millions of Dunans as possible out of the 18 million which are at present uncultivated. This is a long-standing Zionist idea that Palestine is a wasteland, essentially a kind of uncultivated land. To irrigate instead of 40,000, at least 4 million. He also emphasized the impossibility of European Jews living under an Arab government. Quote, a Jewish minority in an Arab state even with the most ideal paper guarantee, would mean the final extinction of Jewish hope, not in Palestine alone, but for the entire Jewish people, for national equality and independence, with all the disastrous consequences so familiar in Jewish history. The fate of the Jewish minority in Palestine will not differ from the fate of the Jewish minority in any other country, except that here it might be much worse. Mm -hmm. So UNSCOP spent a few weeks traveling around Palestine. You've already heard about this. The members noted the military apparatus of the British Mandate State. They said, quote, barbed wire defenses, roadblocks, machine gun posts, and constant armor patrols are routine measures. They met with, with representatives of Irgun, as well as with the Haganah and the Zionist political establishment. And they made a brief trip to Beirut, where they met with delegates from a number of neighboring Arab countries to ascertain Arab views on the question of partition in lieu of speaking with actual Palestinians. Mm. So, the committee's majority finally produced its conclusion. Quote, the claims to Palestine of the Arabs and Jews, both possessing validity, are irreconcilable. Among all of the solutions advanced, partition will provide the most realistic and practical settlement. Mm. This majority report envisioned a three-way division of Palestine, with an Arab state comprising 43% of the mandate territory, including the highlands and a third of the coastline, a Jewish state encompassing 56% of the territory and including the northern coast, the eastern Galilee, and most of the Negev, and a corpus separatum, including Jerusalem and its surrounds, which would be subject to some form of international authority. In describing the plan, of course, the commission members noted that it suffered from many of the same problems as the Peel Commission's 
most centrally, despite the land designations, the, it, the continued presence of large numbers of Arabs in the proposed Jewish state. Mm -hmm. One of the subcommittees even predicted that, quote, at the outset, the Arabs will have a majority in the proposed Jewish state. Mm -hmm. However, unlike the Peel Commission, Scott did not now feel able to include some form of mandatory transfer. So, UNSCOP's majority partition proposal basically represented a continuation of lead concerns and policies and approaches. It accepted the premise that pluralism was inherently problematic and that the United Nations, like its precursor, had a special responsibility to ensure, quote, minority rights, including the protection of the linguistic, religious, and ethnic rights of the people. Further referencing the long-established colonial trope that this was somehow especially true for Palestine, quote, in view of the fact that these two people live physically and spiritually apart, nurture separate aspirations and ideals, and have widely divergent cultural traditions. It also carried on the League's claim that such ethno-national conflicts indicated the UN, as the League's successors, right and indeed responsibility to intervene to protect the principle of nation statehood. Quote, taking into account the charged atmosphere in which the Palestine solution must be effected, it is considered advisable to emphasize the international obligations with regard to peaceful relations, which an independent Palestine would necessarily assume. So, we need to recognize now, though, that not all of the Commission's members supported partition. Three of them, representing India, Iran, and Yugoslavia, ironically, proposed a different solution that would have linked the two communities in a so-called federal state. I think it's worth stepping out and noting here that given the general proliferation of scholarship on Palestine and the kind of current political conversation around the so-called one-state solution, the almost total absence of literature discussing this minority proposal is quite striking. Um, I, there's lots that can be said about this. I'll limit myself in this time that we have left to two observations about this failed proposal. The first is that its explicit rejection of the Zionist-derived political premises surrounding ethno-national separatism pointed up the extent to which the UN in general was promoting, promoting a specifically ethnic and racialized concept of sovereignty. And second, that it implied a much different and more limited role for the UN as arbiter of sovereignties and delimiter of borders than the one that actually emerged, particularly in the Middle East. Mm. So this federal proposal, this minority report, privileged the concept of indigeneity, as they saw it, over the concept of ethnic nationhood and declared real the possibility of a viable pluralistic state. Mm. It said, quote, it is recognized that Palestine is the common country of both indigenous Arabs and Jews, that both these people have had a historic association with it, and that both play vital roles in the economic and cultural life of the country. Its authors went on to explicitly reject ethnic nationalism as the highest expression of sovereignty. Quote, two basic questions have been taken into account in appraising the feasibility of the federal state solution. That is, A, whether Jewish nationalism and the demand for a separate and sovereign Jewish state must be recognized at all costs, and B, whether the will to cooperate in a federal state could be fostered among Arabs and Jews. They concluded, the objectives of a federal state solution would be to give the most feasible recognition to the nationalist aspirations of both Arabs and Jews, to merge them into a single loyalty and patriotism, which would find expression in an independent Palestine. They also declared, that the moral and political prestige of the United Nations is deeply involved and denounced partition as an inevitable cause of future violence. Mm -hmm. Quote, it is important to avoid an acceleration of the separatism which now characterizes the relations of Arabs and Jews in the Near East, and to avoid laying the foundations of a dangerous irredentism there, which would be the inevitable cause, consequences of partition in whatever form. Quite a prescient analysis. Mm -hmm. So this minority report viewed the settlement as consequential not just for Palestine and for its Arab and Jewish residents, but also for the very nature of state sovereignty in the post-war global order and, not incidentally, for the moral authority of the newly constituted UN. This differed substantially from the majority report, which further committed itself definitively to the cause of separatist and ethnic nationalisms while explicitly refusing to address the origins of these 
Um, this is really notable in this report, which, which, which noted, quote, the basic conflict in Palestine is a clash of two intense nationalisms, regardless of the historic origins of the conflict. That is, without regard to the colonial state that had created this situation in the first place, the rights and wrongs of the promise and counter-promises and the international intervention incident to the mandate, there are now in Palestine some 650,000 Jews and some 1,200,000 Arabs who are dissimilar in their ways of living and separated by political interests. Only by means of partition can these conflicting national aspirations find substantial expression and qualify both peoples to take their place as independent nations in the international community and in the United Nations. Mm -hmm. So the disavowal of the colonial origins of the struggle in Palestine allowed for a reorientation of nationalisms as primordial and essential and marked by permanent dissimilarity. And second, the placing of this concept of nationalism at the heart of the question of sovereignty and at the heart of, the mem of, of, of any kind of potential membership in the emerging brotherhood of nations placed the UN itself in a new light, emphasizing its institutional collaboration with successful ethnic nationalisms and remaking its role as one of arbiter and legitimizer of national claims across the globe. So the rejection of the federal proposal then had consequences not just for Palestine itself, but for the nature of international governance in general. The decision to partition Palestine was taken not just on the basis of UNSPOP's consideration of local conditions, but in view of a much more general consensus on the part of the leading members of the General Assembly, in particular, of course, the new permanent members of the Security Council, that the UN, in order to justify its existence, would need to play a muscular role in the remaking of the global order. Partition offered the opportunity for the UN to intervene aggressively in Palestine, first by determining where the border would be, as in these maps that we've been looking at, and then by acting as the primary mediator and interlocutor among the various interests trying to renegotiate the issue. And I would argue as a separate question that we could nevertheless discuss, by serving as the guardian of the hundreds of thousands of refugees created by the partition decision, a status that of course still holds 70 years later. Even more centrally, Palestine offered the opportunity for the UN to affirm to an anxious superpower constituency that it would uphold the absolute centrality and the sole legitimacy of the nation state as the fundamental locus of power in the post-war era. The partition resolution offered the opportunity to showcase the UN enforcing an ethno-national level of sovereignty from its position of international authority. So in my last 30 seconds here, um, I want to suggest that the, these, this view of the partition of Palestine actually explains in part why there was so much interest across the Middle East in subsequent years in non-national models of sovereignty. The Arab League and the broader cause of Arab nationalism, culminating in the short-lived UAR in the, late, in the um, 1950s, took as a fundamental assumption that nation-statehood was a tool of imperial oppression and that alternative modes of claiming independence might serve the region better. And such ideas were, of course, not limited to the Middle East, but enjoyed a great deal of currency across the decolonizing world, where varying concepts of federalism had a moment in anti-colonial movements from the Caribbean to Africa. For many Arab leaders in the post-1948 world, the UN's support for the forcible partition of Palestine, which of course in the end did not lead Palestinians even to the geographically truncated independent Arab state originally envisioned, but rather to permanent dispossession and statelessness, serve to underline the ways in which post-colonial nation-statehood could serve an emerging neo-imperial world order. But it might also help to explain why Arab and especially Palestinian attachment to the nation-state only intensified in the aftermath of 1948 and again 19, after 1967. By endorsing partition and rejecting a federal division of sovereignty for Palestine, the UN had clearly demonstrated that ethnic nationalism represented the only kind of claim to political sovereignty that would have a chance at being heard in the international arena. It is no surprise then that so many Palestinian leaders would come to see their best chance of regaining some of what they had lost as lying in the most intransigent kind of nationalism. The real lesson of 1947 
for the decolonizing world in general and the Palestinians in particular was that a committed ethno nationalism was now the only game in town. Thank you very much, uh, Laura. Thank you, Penny. Um, just make a few uh, short comments, intervention before opening, before giving you some questions on my own and asking for others. Um, <clears throat> so with uh, two papers that complement each other quite nicely, uh, Penny was showing the continuity, if you like, between the 1937 Peel partition proposals and then um, what was proposed 10 years later, although there were some, some differences with regard to um, the exclusion of Transjordan and uh, there wasn't a forced population transfer. Um, so perhaps one, one way to, 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 perhaps it's worth t taking a step back as well um, when thinking about these partition plans because really we're speaking about a, re a repartition in the sense that Palestine itself was the product of partition. Um, and if we go back to what was originally uh, demanded by the Sharif of Mecca, he was speaking of a unified uh, Arab kingdom. Um, as we know, that's not what happened. There was the Sykes-Picot agreement, there was then the mandates that were established, there were all kinds of disputes about whether Palestine uh, was included or not. So there was then another partition in 1922, where Transjordan or Jordan was separated uh, from the Palestine mandate. So the revisionists in Israel today some, some revisionists you know, complain that that was the first partition, if you like. So when we actually begin the story, it was 1936. The Peel partition proposals, and then the Woodhead, and then the UN. In fact, that's, that's even later. Um, so the way, um, but I do think that uh, 1937 is, is a key moment, um, uh, not just with regard to the Peel Commission and the uh, Arab uprising, but and you've written on this, the failure to establish representative government. And I'll ask you maybe a question about that uh, later. And it's also, and perhaps this is also where we begin to see a parallel with, or a difference also with uh, India. I think it's worth, worth highlighting that you know, there were no elections that were held in, in the Palestine mandate, uh, because it was taken as a given that the Arabs would immediately put an end to Jewish uh, immigration. Um, and this is also why the Arab states and the Palestinians were boycotting uh, UNSTOP. Uh, but interestingly, between 1936 and 1939, we begin to see um, a reaction from um, uh, the Muslim League um, in India and some other work I've done that appears to show that there's a connection between the rejection of partition in 1939 and then we've seen this and, uh, and um, threats from Mohammed Ali Jinnah and others not to allow Muslim troops to serve in the British army in, in Palestine. So we actually see, see something coming together there, which might also explain the political reasons as to why uh, partition was um, rejected in 1939, not just because it was impractical, but also because of these wider uh, developments. We then see uh, partition throughout the Second World War also being discussed in the cabinet, although it never actually being published, and then it's um, not uh, supported. Um, and then Britain kind of asks Unstop to come with some proposals, but then at the same time saying that they were not willing to enforce uh, a, a proposal that went against the wishes of the Arabs or, or Jews. Um, and as we know uh, from Laura and Scott, then uh, the majority plan proposed uh, partition. But the story then doesn't end, because <laughs> if you read the UN partition plan, there is a commission that is established to, to actually, well, the idea was that they would travel to the mandates, meet with Arab and Jewish groups, and if you like, put effect uh, this, this plan. But curiously, in January 1948, the British government says, well, we're not going to cooperate with this commission, um, and they frustrate, uh, and they, you have several reports from January to think, April 1948 of the commission saying, please let us in. I think they allow one individual in, uh, very late in the day, and nothing he can do. He's hunkered down, I think, um, in the middle of Jerusalem. You know, so police everywhere, soldiers are everywhere, and nothing he can, he can do. So I suppose this leads me to my 
uh, to my questions. Um, well, I think, well, one of the questions perhaps I'll give to Laura is why, why, why do you see Britain decided not to cooperate with, with the Palestine Commission and whether had the Palestine Commission been allowed to get on with this work, whether it would have made any, any difference. Um, and then for, for Penny, perhaps you could say a bit more about the failure of Pierre Walcott's proposals you know, to have um, uh, some, kind of, some kind of representative government which was then um, shot down in Parliament and then there was the Arab uprising to, there was a connection to partition there. And I'm also curious why, I don't know if both of you can answer this, why the UN partition plan made a distinction between the Arab states in Palestine, Arabs in Palestine and children, trans children. Did, did they see the Palestinians as a separate nation or community to the Jordanians, or were there other reasons for why trans children was not being included? Um, it's an interesting question, and it is a, 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 an ironic moment in many respects, right, to, um, the British refusal to cooperate. I think I, I, I would hazard a couple of hypotheses here. I think, for one thing, that the domestic situation in Britain had changed so dramatically that no stance on Palestine was really um, viable for the new kind of constituencies that had come into play after the war. You know, it just, it was not a saleable position. None of, there was, there was, there was no saleable position in British domestic circles on Palestine in 1948. The British were determined not to spend one more dime um, on what had been, in their view, an incredibly intensive resource um, allocation for the last few decades. Um, I think that, you know, part of it is financial. Of course, the British are not doing well economically after the war. Um, they have military, um, they have, they have military requirements elsewhere that are pulling them in other directions. Um, they, I think that it's a matter of resources as much as anything, that they just don't want to make the commitment regardless of how limited it might be. Um, and probably with the fear that should they agree to police this commission, that then there would be an next one and an next one, right? And I think that leads us into the question of whether this would have made any difference. I cannot imagine that it would. Um, the British and the UN and any representatives of the League that were kind of hanging on at this point had no currency, no moral currency among Palestinian Arabs by this point. Um, not to mention, I think something we often don't remember is the effect of the revolt on the Palestinian by 1939, almost every recognizable leader within the Palestinian nationalist movement had been deported, arrested, or executed. There was nobody left to make these decisions. I think that's one of the issues, that by the time the war started, there was nobody left to make these decisions. So, I mean, when you're talking about could reasonable negotiation have saved the situation, I think the answer is absolutely not. Who would they talk to? Um, you know, the, the situation had been so violent for so long, you know, that the revolt went on for three years and it was absolutely murderous. Um, so I think that that's something we often don't really think about, um, is what the Palestinian political community's kind of shape was by 1947 even, um, and that's clearly relevant to kind of developments after that, but really the boycott was the only um, political action So I'm going to start uh, by addressing this question of the sort of failure of, of representative government. Um, and I think there's a, there's, as you know, a, bit, a long history to this. Um, there are attempts through the 1920s and 1930s um, by the British to, you know, to, I guess to square the circle, right? I mean, to, to set up some sort of a legislative council. Um, there are proposals for a legislative council not representative, or were there enough were there enough British members that they sort of outweigh um, Arab members? So it's I mean there's and, and you know this is uh, to Laura's point in, in her talk about the league. I mean this is one of the places where league pressures come to bear on British policy making. That you know there there is at least. 
on paper, at least, um, there is this push towards representative government. Um, and that's, you know, that's written into the mandate at the same time as Arab political rights are written out. Um, so you have these sort of internal contradictions in the mandate text. Um, at the same time, you, you do have this sort of, look, the, the, the entire mandatory system is built on the assumption that at some point these nations will stand on their own. And you know, how is that going to be affected when you have no possibility where it, it looks like you have no possibility of representative government. I mean there's also like in the in the sort of regional context, right? There's also the you know the, the pressure that um, the you know independence of Iraq and its uh, you know it's joining the league um, in 1932. 32, um, has on the, on the Palestine situation, right? It sort of highlights in a way, this is another sort of so-called hate class mandate, it's another former Ottoman territory. I mean, you know, plenty of people have written about how that independence is um, in name only. Um, and you know, it's incredibly convenient for the British, it's the British who actually push um, for the end of the Iraq mandate, because it's going to be much cheaper and much better for them to just have a treaty um, than to deal with sort of mandatory rule and, and you know, uprisings on. Um, but I do think, you know, that's also putting pressure at this constant failure to have successful legislative councils um, to affect any kind of representative government. Um, uh, you know, it's, it's tremendously, you know, it, it fires Arab uprising, but it also fires your British despair, I think. Um, and so, you know, I think that, that pushes partition to the forefront as, um, as a sort of solution, not just to conflict, actually, right? I mean, partition does a few things. It's not just a solution to conflict, it's actually a way of getting out of this problem of representative government, right? We so we, we, you know, we, we allocate sovereignty um, uh, to get out of that problem. Um, that was a long answer. Um, why, why did Unstop cut off transfer? That's a, I mean, that's a, that's a good question. There's there's so much, um, you know, the, the British contacts, the Hashemite British Zionist triangle that's going on behind the scenes. Um, I think there's an unawareness of that, and that that merging, sort of remerging Trans Jordan and this Arab part of Palestine would actually play into that, those plans. Um, uh, I think also, I mean, the, you brought up the, the, the actual partition commission, right? It's supposed to implement things on the ground. And one of the things that's striking a little bit of reading that I've done in those um, papers is how little they envision an actual Arab state as this, right? They, they really, I, I mean, that's, that's a striking thing um, the, that the maps really don't show, right? They show the creation of states, but when you look at the, um, at the partition commissions, plans for implementing partition and how are these states going to be set up and on what time frame. Um, the Jewish state, and this of course is a legacy of British rule, right? There is a Jewish shadow government. I mean, I, there's a Jewish legislative assembly, there are, you know, there's, there, there are sort of shadow um, government uh, offices already. And so that transfer of power is going to be quite smooth. And as Laura said, I mean, there is no Arab, there is no Palestinian Arab leadership. Structurally within the mandate, there is no Arab agency. There never was an Arab agency. So there's not, there isn't that infrastructure to transfer power into. And the, the, part, the UN Partition um, Commission mirrors that, right? They, they set up, you know, they envision setting up a Jewish state right and really having an Arab state kind of under semi-permanent you know, semi UN um, trusteeship. I wonder if you can buy the news from the Arab state. OK, uh, well, this is a time for, for questions from, from any of you. If you can raise your hands and uh, uh, explain your uh, ideation. Thank you very much. Very interesting papers. Uh, from a comparative perspective, uh, I suppose one could say that the fact that the UN 
pretty lost out to the war. If the war has not helped matters, I mean, they kind of really build themselves out. Um, and, you know, my understanding, the little I can say, you know, of, of why partition, why the British didn't support it, why the American support it, uh, has to do, I mean, you've touched on the Arab, but what about the American rule period, and especially of the president? I mean, listen to both of you. Yeah, yeah. I mean, really, really. Um, well, I would say, first of all, that especially after, well, after the 1939 White Paper, the Zionist leadership in Palestine made the decision to stop appealing to its British okay. sponsors and to begin appealing to future American sponsors. So, for example, the conference that was held in New York in 1942 um, is an important kind of marking point for the, that change in um, external assistance, right? I do think it's important, you know, I think it's important not to kind of assume it happens instantly because actually, you know, the American interest in Zionism is very kind of attenuated for quite a long time. Um, and that even within, even within Jewish American politically active groups, there, there are, there's a lot of uncertainty through the 1930s, for instance, about how to regard the Zionist movement. You know, it's certainly not, it's not a monolithic approach of support, right? So I think that, I think that campaign to kind of win over the Americans um, actually takes quite a long time. And then it's built on a premise of fairly radical ignorance on the part of the American administration. So we can see it's a, a long tradition of life, um, about anything to do with the Middle East, right? I mean, Truman had no, he, he just had no context for this conversation. Um, and I think that, you know, so his context was something else. And I think actually that this question of sovereignty is relevant because the kind of ethno-national sovereignty and nation-state model, the institutions that were already there, the kind of, you know, um, you know, latent state that the Zionists had built in Palestine during the 20s and 30s was something that Truman recognized, um, you know, something that, that, that kind of American political establishment could understand as a kind of potential future ally, and that's that's actually highly relevant. So the partition plan is a is is the, the vote for partition is in part a vote for recognizable forms of nation statehood, right? Um, but you know, I also think we have to recognize we we can't underestimate the role of political ignorance in this, in this moment. Um, it's a lesson that's you know come home recently, but I think it's. I, I think it's I think it's really true for this period too that one of the reasons it takes so long is because there aren't very many people in any of those American administrations through the 40s and 50s who really know anything about the Middle East. Roosevelt himself proposed all kinds of insane transfer plans for the Palestinian Arabs to be shipped out to Iraq or the Sinai or Argentina or you know. Yeah. Yes, exactly. <laughs> I mean, it was, um, you know, so so I think that there's there's quite a long tradition basically of just having no, like, no context for making these kinds of political decisions. Mm -hmm. I get I that was it. Yes. <laughs> um, I, I mean, I'm thinking that the only sort of other context to, to throw in here is the sort of emerging Cold War. Yes. Um, well, that's important. Yeah. <laughs> um, and 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 there I think. You know, there's a, there's a certain amount of strategic positioning that the Americans do inside this sort of cloud of ignorance, um, <clears throat> trying to jockey sort of geostrategically and and you know making the calculation that that the British haven't made, right? But making the calculation that you know this setting up or. or betting on the horse, whatever the right analogy is, right, that already has a sort of nascent state that is in this critical location um, is going to serve U.S. interests as it's clear, you know, that the Soviets are also starting to make moves in that direction, right? And there is, I mean, if you, you know, in, in the in sort of immediate aftermath of um, the declaration of the state of Israel, it's like, you can see the U.S. and the Soviet Union kind of rushing to, oh, who's, who's going to you know, who's going to get this um, sort of prized place, which is really odd. I mean, from a British perspective, it's like, thank God, you know, we're out of there. Um, and then with the it's British, oil. Yeah, yes, yes, of course, of course. But even, even as late as 1956, you know, the yes. Suez is yes. not really 
Thank you for both for this yeah, presentation. Uh, I'm Sonny Swedeman from Palestine. So I have some background of, of all you mentioned. Uh, I have some points and some questions for you. First, uh, some part even from the Arabs that the Arab at that time they agree with this partition uh, so that they don't vote against the law and even after the decision. Things would be different now. So the Palestinians would have their state, up to 46 percent of the land, and the Jewish have their state. And some of the Tunisian president visited the Middle East at that time in Lebanon, Jericho. He declared that, and some Arabs who were conservative, they said, "No, this is not true. The Jewish would have this is have nothing to do with this uh, uh, with this situation." Uh, second point, uh, she mentioned about the U.S. I think maybe the U.S. administration at that time or the policy maker, they don't have a businessman in the U.S. They are all that they even, some of them convinced some nations in Africa to vote in favor for that the partition. So, so there were some interests, maybe not from the policy makers, but from Jewish, uh, some big lobbies in the, uh, in the states at that time. Uh, yeah, I think that's it. I'll take a round of round questions. Uh, Stephanie and Rich. Yeah, so, okay, so as we reflect on, um, on uh, Panchi itself, I think probably if you don't uh, spare a thought on the unfinished business of partition. Especially if you look at the um, the the, the, the uh, Kashmir dispute, which you know uh, it's part, partly because partition partition was actually um, in, in, in in complete work. So um, could the panel actually draw some similarities between um, on the unfinished business of, of partition between um, you know Israel Palestine and India and Pakistan? Um, the the another question that I would like to ask. You know, if we look at the countries that voted uh, against the UN partition plan, we see three non-Muslim countries there, India, Cuba, and Greece. And um, Cuba's um, opposition to, to the partition was very, very interesting. And it was, you know, something, it was due to the, uh, they, they, they were very worried uh, that this will, you know, actually affect the uh, concept, the right of self-determination. So, um, so I would like to hear from the panel, based on, on what happened in India, uh, in India and in, um, and in, you know, in Israel and Palestine, do you think that this has made a very significant and long-term um, impact on the, on the right of self-determination since what uh, President Woodrow uh, Wilson has actually uh, concepted? I mean, after this, do you, do you see uh, that, that there's been you know, a, 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 a big change in the right of self-determination? Thanks. I'll look at that as a question. That's a question. Well, this is a small question to Billy. You've got a few maps on the slide. I think you showed one map on the UNSCOP report 1947. And there are two. One, the UNSCOP proposed, and one which was adopted by the General Assembly. But both the maps do not include bulk of the Negev and the access to Gaza of Kabul to the Jewish state. I think probably you can take a second look at the map you have put up. So this is probably the right map, because if you look at the map alone, this is the one. Bulk of the things are out there. The map you put up in 1947, it actually puts the entire uh, till to the Gulf of Akaba as part of the proposed Jewish state. Just if you take a second look at the map, I don't know whoever has put up the map, it's not accurate. There's a lot to think about here. Um, in terms of the kind of counterfactual of what what would it have looked like if the Palestinians had accepted the partition proposal? 
Yes, the Arabs in general. Um, well, first of all, I mean, I, I do want to stress, and, and I totally agree with what you're saying about the nature of this kind of imagined Arab state, um, that it's very difficult to see it emerging as a successful political entity, even in the in a circumstance of agreement. Because there was no political leadership, because there were no structures, because the Zionists refused to agree to borders of any kind, right? We have armistice lines instead of actual um, drawn borders. Um, there was, in fact, you know, a kind of at least a branch within the Zionist movement that had territorial expansionist kind of ambitions. Um, but I think even more fundamental is the kind of it's not just, you know, going back to this question of the legislative assembly, it isn't just that the mandate didn't succeed in setting up some kind of representation for the Palestinian Arabs. The reason the Arabs never signed on to the legislative assembly was because it would be restricted from discussing the conditions of the mandate, right? That is everything that mattered, right? Everything. Immigration, land sales, Zionist development, you know, the nature of government, the mandate itself, right? So it was a meaningless question. And even if it had been set up, it would, it would have been an entirely meaningless institution. And in fact, I would argue that when in all of the mandatory territories, not just Palestine, although maybe most dramatically there, you know, these mandate, Britain and France went into Lebanon and Syria and Iraq and they actively demolished the institutions of representation that were already there. And they did that because, precisely because the League was requiring evidence of progress towards self-determination, and the further back you started, the longer that would take, right? So I would argue it's actually much more deliberate, right? That actually, um, this is, you know, it's not necessarily a concerted plan, but it is certainly a thought out approach. And so when you think about the counterfactual, I think it's very hard to imagine how a successful state could have been built from those foundations, um, even with Palestinian cooperation. Um, and so, I mean, and, and that part of what the Arabs and the Palestinians in particular were protesting was what they saw as a kind of radical illegitimacy of these institutions in the first place, right? Including the UN itself. Um, so I think, I think it's just a very difficult thing to imagine. Um, and, you know, of course now, maybe it doesn't actually matter very much, um, although it is interesting to kind of think about, I don't know, what you would, you would agree with. I would just tie, tie the two questions together and sort of build on uh, what Laura has said um, about, you know, this question of self-determination, um, and I think it links very nicely to this question of imagining. Because, I mean, self-determination had died in 1919. Um, it, you know, the, the King Crane Commission <laughs> goes in and, and you know basically takes these sort of surveys and asks people you know what do you want um, and the answer is you know independence right self you know self rule some sort of self rule um, the entire mandate system I mean it's it's really odd right because if you look at the text of the mandates they're set up to bring people into sort of ultimate self-determination. But setting up the mandates in the first place was done in complete contravention of that principle of self-determination because the people had been canvassed and they'd said what they wanted um, and you know, that gets ignored. So I, you know, I think it, maybe, the, maybe the two questions sort of work together that I'm not sure, you know, I'm not sure that it's partition that's this moment of failure um, or that's this moment of the sort of death of self-determination. <coughs> Partition is in a lot of ways the outcome, the sort of logical outcome of the establishment of the mandate system in the first place. It's the sort of working out of imperial, western, whatever we want to call them, interests um, in the post-war period, but they've been encoded in the mandate system from the very beginning. I think too, I mean, to kind of connect your question as well, but, um, Part of it is about political structures, right? Because one thing that happened with Palestinian nationalism in the early years was that it was very tied into the idea of a greater Syria. Yeah. Um, and that, that was an example of an essentially non-national form of political organization that was 
totally unacceptable at the international level and continue to be totally unacceptable. So the partition, you know, quote unquote solution is a kind of, you know, down the road consequence of that sort of thinking, right? And I think that we can imagine, I mean, it, to, to bring it back to your question too, supposing in 1947 the Palestinians had said, you know, okay, we don't like it, but we'll take it, right? And we're going, you're going to see the emergence of two ethnically defined nation states next door to each other, right? That have as their very principle these kind of, you know, the same kinds of exclusionary principles of citizenship that characterize the nation states around the world um, in the post war era. So I think it does have an impact on the kind of self determination that emerges, right? Um, that even proposing that kind of, you know, quote unquote solution means there are no other options. There are no federal options, there are no pluralistic options, there are no ways to think about sovereignty in ways that don't reflect deeply committed ethno-communal commitments, right, and nationalisms. Um, so I think that, you know, it's probably not, I, it, it relates to what we were discussing in the last panel, that, you know, it's, it is part of the tragedy here is the loss of a different kind of vision for statehood and for sovereignty. But indeed, I mean, again, to, to take the history back a ways, it's like this, these are territories that are carved out of a multinational, multilinguistic, multi ethnic empire that collapsed, right? I mean, so these are Ottoman remnants. So, in some ways, it's not terribly surprising. Like, that model has collapsed. I mean, it's collapsed in the Ottoman Empire, it's collapsed in the Habsburg Empire. So, um, this, is, this is sort of a longer, a much longer story. One more, one more question before we break for lunch, so the gentleman's hand is hand yeah, up. So I'm talking about Shikashish and Peter with the political science department. So I work on decolonization and ethnic conflicts, a kind of political scientist dabbling in this field. So question <laughs> Professor uh, Robson. But, uh, my voice is so one question is, uh, one of the things I find studying this stuff for other countries is that uh, what happens to the armed forces under the the British mandate because in a lot of other countries, ethnic groups, even when they did not have democratic majorities, uh, were overrepresented in the armed forces and then used that as a leverage to get a share of political power yeah. right after independence. And now, I would imagine that in, in, in this context, even though there are all these Jewish militias, there would be questions about the loyalty of the Jewish uh, population. I would imagine that there would be fair representation of Arabs. With the United Armed Forces of War, did the Armed Forces just disappear? So that's one question. I mean, if you have anything to say on that. And a question for Professor uh, Sidanam. Uh, and this is since it's in the spirit of comparison, right? We brought up this issue of this uh, uh, the, the Turkish, sorry, Turkish Jew, uh, the Greek, Turkish. The Greek yeah. exchange. What is it about this particular episode? Uh, because I have studied the Sikh mobilization during 1947. And one of the interesting things is, you know, at the beginning, in the early 1947, the Sikhs are in no mood for partition and population transfers. But then, like two months before, they're talking about population transfers as if it's something very easy. <coughs> and one of the examples they bring up is, well, it was possible with the Greeks and the Turks, so why not here? So what is about this? I mean, and I really don't understand this as well, so you can share some light about why this is such a should I start there and then we can work our way backwards? Um, okay, have lunch. Um, uh, so, you know, the, the Greek and Turkish population exchanges, um, I think they serve, there's a whole sort of rhetoric around those, well, first of all, I think calling them population transfers is problematic, although that's what, you know, that's what the league calls them, that's how they're referred to, that's how British officials refer to them. Um, I mean, much of much of the exchange of population that happens between Greece and Turkey, first of all, happens in the context of war. Um, I think that's important, right? This is not orderly. This isn't sort of take a number, line up, and we'll exchange you, right? So it happens in the context of war. Happens with a great deal of bloodshed, and it's only fairly late in the game that the international community, in the, in the form of the League of Nations, gets involved, sort of as a way to rubber stamp what's already happened. Um, but also to try to manage basically refugee populations, right, and settlement, um, and 
camps. Um, so I think that, you know, the question maybe is like, why, why the rhetoric emerges that this was a successful, orderly way of um, reducing friction? It's also, I mean, I think it's also significant that this is a, this is a movement of populations between two existing sovereign states. Right? This is not the creation of new states, right? Greece is there, Turkey's there. Um, we're not having, we're, this isn't a situation where you have to create a new state and then move people around. Um, this, is, um, this is a post facto sort of international approval of the flight of peoples. Um, so, so that doesn't answer your question. I mean, your question then is like, so why is this? as so appealing. Partially, um, I think because in some ways, and this is true also for the partition of Ireland, like in some ways it looks successful in the sort of 30s and 40s. It looks like it has actually reduced international friction. Um, I mean, it, it normalizes relations between Greece and Turkey for a time. Um, I mean, the Greek Turkish exchange is actually a study moment in some respects. Uh, I would make I want I want to make two additional points. One is that I think part of what happens, I you're absolutely right that most most of it is a kind of you know ex post facto approval on the international level of movements that have already taken place. However, the league also did actually move another two hundred thousand people forcibly, right? And the people objected to Right? There were, there were the cases involving studies that the League appointed what they called a mixed commission to investigate claims that people, you know, people claimed to have Albanian citizenship or to be from Istanbul or, you know, any of these kind of loopholes in order not to be moved. Um, and it involved an incredibly kind of, you know, traumatic displacement that also was largely, you know, one of dispossession, almost total dispossession on the part of a lot of these people. So the League did have an active role in moving people who hadn't already left. Um, and they were comfortable with doing that forcibly, right? They were, they were comfortable with that. And I think part of the reason for that is that it offered them a showcase for their new role as the arbiters of international conflict, right? I mean, they were also, it's a bit like, like Palestine in 1938. The League was new-ish in 1923. Um, and it was kind of, you know, there are, there's all this rhetoric about refugees in that moment where the league officials are saying, only we can deal with this problem because we are a supra-state organization, right? So we have the, the responsibility and the right to move around refugees, to decide what should happen to refugees, to draw borders, to move people, right? That this is partly, I think it's a mode of cleaning league authority and that by casting the Greek Tur Turkish exchange as a success, they can make the case for their continued relevance right into the 1930s. And it's an argument that really starts to fall apart after 1933, right? Um, for for obvious reasons. So I think I think it is actually quite an important moment. Yeah. They also, I mean, I was thinking as you're talking, they, they also oversee and sort of help with the negotiations around populations that aren't going to move, right? All of the exceptions. Yes. Um, and those those are, you know, that that's an interesting flip side of population exchange. Because like, once the league gets involved, population exchange is managed in different ways. So that there's forcible movement of some people, and then there's exemptions for others, yes. right? Um, and so it's the sort of international bureaucratization, I guess, of forced movement, um, right? Yes. Okay. On that note, uh, I'd like to uh, <laughs> thank Penny and uh, Laura and uh, invite you all to lunch uh, without their thank you. Thank you, Dr. Patan and distinguished panelists. May we invite our speakers and VIPs to proceed for lunch and fire outside? I'm starting to guide you.